Hi, in this talk, I'm going to share with you the experiences that I've had of working with students at Rutgers, Uni uh, Rutgers University at Camden. Camden, New Jersey is among the most underprivileged cities in the country. A large fraction of our students come from underprivileged backgrounds. Most students hold jobs while they are studying. Many of them hold full-time jobs. A majority of the students transfer from community colleges. What this means is they spend two years at a community college and then transfer to Rutgers Camden and then finish the remaining two years there. What this also implies is that we have a very small window of time during which we can have an impact on these students. And many of our students lack the kind of ambition that is evident at their peers at other more prestigious inst institutions. As an example, hardly any student from Rutgers Camden Computer Science Department had gone to graduate school until 2009. To give you an idea of the kind of background that our students come from, let me share with you a personal statement that one of my students had written when he applied for summer internships. In high school, I did not care for education and felt it didn't care for me. Senior year in high school, I did not know what was going to happen. I had only applied to one college, Rutgers Camden, the school closest to my home. I only applied because in our country, college is what everyone does after high school, since almost any job now requires a college education. I got admitted to Rutgers Camden, but I had no idea what I was doing there and barely coasted through courses. I felt like I had no future. I joined as a faculty in computer science at Rutgers Camden in 2003. And soon after I joined, after interacting with students, it was clear that the students lack confidence in themselves. Likewise, when I talked to faculty, I realized that the faculty lacked confidence in the students' abilities, which was reflected in the quality of the courses that were being offered. And even though I had some really bright students in my class, I was not able to convince my colleagues that we had some amazing students with a lot of potential. And with a little bit of support, they can do just as well as their peers. My initial advice to students was, go somewhere else. In hindsight, it, it's a very silly thing to do, and clearly not a sustainable solution at any school, and especially at Rutgers Camden, given the underprivileged background that our students come from. Not too long after this, I met Brad Greening, who took a Math Foundations course with me. He was one of the best students in the class. But he made it very clear when I met him, uh, out, uh, I mean outside of the class, that Raji moving to an another university is not an option for me. And he said, he said, look, first of all, I cannot afford. Second thing is I'm doing very well, and I have a full-time job as a customer sales representative at Comcast, which I'm not willing to quit. Now, to inspire Brad to consider academics more seriously, I invited him to do research with me during the summer summer of 2007. We applied for a small dean's award, I mean for a dean's award which paid him a small sum of $400 that would cover his transportation cost as well as cost to buy the books and so on. And it was mainly done to motivate Brad to consider this opportunity seriously. After the first few meetings, first few research meetings, Brad stopped coming to the meetings. I sent him emails, he would not reply to my emails. I was clearly quite upset. Come fall semester, September first week, Brad sees me in the hallways, goes in the other direction. I chase him down, I call him to my office. I still remember he told me, Rajiv, I have a class. I said, forget the class, come to my office. We go to my office, I was, I, I, and he could see that I was upset. And I told him, I said, look, I need to write a report to the dean about what happened with this money. Of course, I could have written something and sent it to the dean, but I wanted him to realize that it is his, his responsibility. And he told me, Rajiv, what can I do to fix it? Keep in mind, he was a customer sales representative. Right? So at that time, I told him, I had this book lying on my shelves, proofs that really count the art of communitable proof. I told Brad, take this book, read it, and present to me the material from this book. I was meaning to read it, but I, I didn't have the time. He took that book, and every week he would come to my office after reading material from the book, and he would present that material to me. By the end of fall semester, he had, he had read large fractions of the book, and he did a great job the entire semester. I told him to prepare a presentation on this material that he, had, uh, he had, he, that he had been teaching me. He gave an outstanding talk in the department colloquium in January of 2008. And this is the email that I get from one of my colleagues. You know, I had him in my class a few years ago. And based on that, I would have never guessed that he'd be capable of the seminar talk he gave a few weeks back. You've obviously been very good for him. Around that time, this was January of 2008. Around that time, the posts for summer internship for 2008 were coming out. And I wanted Brad to get, those, I mean, get that opportunity. And I told him to apply for those, for those internships, but I told him, I will only support your application if you quit your job. 
because at, by, at that time I realized that his, when, uh, his, his job, full-time job was affecting his studies and also I did not want what happened to me the previous summer to happen to somebody else. And after several conversations, Brad told me, Rajiv, look, it is, it, is, it is not going to happen. I cannot quit my job. He told me, when I'm in your office, when, when I'm talking to you, I feel completely convinced that I should quit my job and focus on academics and eventually good things will happen. But when I leave your office, I go to my friends and family, I have no support. They think this is an absurd thing to do. So I was not too hopeful, but I told him, you know, think about it and let me know. I was obviously quite frustrated at that point that I could not convince the student to do what I really thought was good for them. And then he writes to me an email in January 2008, towards the late January 2008, which turns out to be among the most significant events that has happened at Rutgers Camden since I joined. This is the email he wrote. Look, it, it's, it's in January past midnight, and the subject is decision. It was that important a decision for him. I would like to try to go for it. You can sense the tentativeness in the tone. As per our discussion, I figure, even if things do not work out with the work we will have done, plus the plan to do the data structures work, I will be well able to get another job should the worst case happen. You can sense the negative mindset. He's not feeling confident about this decision. By my figures, a lower bound of $550 per month would allow me to pay my parents their money, plus the car insurance, gas, and phone. I again want to emphasize the background that our students come from. He is talking about paying rent to his parents for the house that they live in together, his contribution towards the rent. So Brad quits his job. In, in uh, two, 2008, he gets a summer internship during, for, uh, for, for, for summer of 2008. During the academic year 2008-2009, a lot of things happened. First thing, very important, I get support from the National Science Foundation. I, we get funding from the National Science Foundation. This was very important because now my students at Camden could, could quit their jobs and solely focus on academics. And I could, I could use this funding to support them. Second is, I increased the workload significantly in the Math Foundation score. So my, I was still getting bothered that the courses were not as challenging that, as, as I would expect them to be. So well, I used that to my advantage. If the students are not challenged in other courses, that means they have more time to work on my courses. So I gave them assignment pretty much every class that was due in the next class. Right? And, and, they, and, and they were forced to do it because this was a core course in computer science. And I was going to teach not only that semester, two semesters after that. So if they had to drop the class and wait for somebody else to teach, they had to wait for another year. <laughs> now, this also helped in many ways. It helped in instill a strong work ethic in the students. If they did well, it gave them the confidence that they needed. And thirdly, I kept thinking that my students are just as strong as students at other more elite institutions. Was I correct? I was clearly in the minority, right, at, at my school. So the thing is, if they did well, and thanks to the internet, I would take the exam questions and homework questions from some of the top programs and give them to my students, in fact, in, in less time to do it. And I, when my students did well, I was pretty sure that these students are just as good as anyone else. Tom DeHart and James postponed their graduation. Tom DeHart comes to my office in fall of 2008, he tells me, Rajiv, I want to thank you for the courses you have taught me and I, I, I'm going to graduate next semester. So I asked him, what do you plan to do after, after graduation? He said, go and get a job. I said, I don't think uh, it, it will be easy for you to get a job because you don't have strong foundations. Keep in mind, I'm a faculty telling a senior who's graduating that you will not get a job because you don't have strong foundations. And he tells me politely, he said, what do you, what do you think I should do? I was teaching two freshman level classes at that time. I said, retake those classes. Quite, quite surprisingly, he said, fine, I'll do it. I told him, retake those classes. Work hard on research during the spring, and your career is my responsibility. I have no idea why I made that statement. I had no idea how, how I was going to deliver that. But I said it with a very genuine interest in his own career. James Davis, uh, our paths crossed as follows. I had a student, Kelly, in my math foundations class. I would ask questions to Kelly in the class and to the other students. Kelly would sometimes answer the questions correctly, sometimes not correctly, which is fine. But her homeworks were perfect. So I called Kelly to my office. I said, hey, what's going on? And she was very candid. She says, I have this friend, James Davis, who helps me with my homeworks. So I said, oh, since he's doing so much work, why doesn't he come and take, my, I mean, take the class? She said, oh, he's a senior in math, and this will be too easy for him. I said, making things challenging is always easy. Ask him to come. And I didn't expect him to come. But next day, James Davis walks in my class. After a few weeks, I called James to my office. I said, what, what are your plans? And he said, oh, I have been working at ShopRite, a grocery chain in New Jersey, ever since I graduated from high school. And I plan to continue there after I graduate, the, graduate next semester. 
I said, can ShopRite wait for six months? Can you quit your job and can we do some research together? He said, oh, that's not a problem. I can get, I can get a job at ShopRite anytime. I said, great, thank you. There was still a piece of puzzle that needed to be solved. I was very clear that our students at Camden are just as good as anyone else. How do I convince the rest of the world? I had a hard time convincing my own colleagues. That is when I started thinking that what is it that my students could do that would give them an edge. And then I realized that most undergrads at, at, at most places in the country do not, are not involved in undergraduate research. So if my students do research, that will give them an edge. So I introduced a course during which the students read and, and presented research papers. Keep in mind they, they do two years at a community college. They, many of them don't have the background. But I would give them the necessary background for them to be able to read and understand research papers. During the department colloquium in spring of 2009, every single talk was given by undergraduate students. This doesn't happen at almost any place in the country where the audience is the faculty of the department and the speakers are the undergraduate students talking about cutting edge research topics. Brad gets admitted into the PhD program. This is the first student department getting admitted into the program. It was a big deal. Several internships for summer of 2009, except one student. Tom Dehart, the student whom I told that your career is my responsibility, got rejected at every single internship that he applied to. Right? He did everything that I had asked him to do. Okay, this is a big deal. A senior close to graduating, a faculty tells him take freshman level classes, and I will, and, and, and good things will happen. And he believed me. And I was obviously very shattered that I could not deliver. I asked him, I said, if you would have so the good thing at that time was I had NSF funding. So I was not too concerned about supporting him, but he was not interested in my research area. He was interested in human computer interaction. So I asked him. Among, if you would have gotten an offer at all the places you had applied to, what would have been your top choice? He said, I would have liked to, liked to go to Virginia Tech. I emailed folks at Virginia Tech. I told them, money is not an issue. I have, I have the support. Can you please give him position in your lab? I get an email back saying, only if you can support because we don't have money, we will give Tom a position in the lab. Thanks to NSF, Tom got a position at Virginia Tech. He goes there for the summer. At the end of summer, we get emails, or Tom gets emails. In the first email, he said, I have enjoyed working with you on this project. Kathy mentioned you are submitting applications for graduate school. I hope you will consider applying to UW. This is the University of Wisconsin-Madison, one of the top programs. We are a well-funded program, highly ranked, and have many opportunities for research. He also gets the following email. You may recall that we met during your summer research project at Virginia Tech. I heard that you are applying for grad admissions here. I wanted to encourage you to apply. The same student who got turned down at every place just a few months later, is being sought after by some of the top programs in the country. James Davis continued working with, on research with me and got opportunities to present his work at, at, at the seminar series at some, at, at some of the other universities. I get this email from my colleague there. Thanks, Rajiv. It was good to see both you and your maturing student, James. It is really nice that these guys can understand such key research papers. These are under, undergraduate students presenting research papers. Four more students now get admitted to graduate programs, Cornell, Dartmouth, Princeton, and Virginia Tech. So in two years now, we have had five students getting admitted to top graduate programs. The culture in the department is now changing. At one time, I was chasing the students, trying to convince them for hours, for days sometimes, why focusing on academics is good for them. Now I get emails such as this, Professor, I quit my job and I'm ready for any challenge you have to offer. I also get emails such as this. It's Nick from your 171 and 213 courses. I'm graduating this semester, and I just wanted to take a minute to thank you for the courses you taught me. I may not have been your best student, but I definitely learned a lot from your courses, and I thank you for making us all work hard to learn. Keep up your teaching methods. They work well. Again, it was a validation that students at Camden wanted challenging courses. Clearly, you cannot make a course challenging and not be there, but I was there to help them when they needed help. At the same time, make the, made the courses challenging. So to give you an idea, let me show you the career trajectory of some of the students. James Davis, his high school GPA was so low that he did not get admitted to Rutgers Camden. He had to go to a community college, boost his GPA, then got admitted to Rutgers Camden. He planned to work at ShopRite, his employer, after high school. He quits his job in 2009 on my suggestion uh, at, at, uh, at ShopRite. He starts his graduate studies in Cornell, at Cornell in 2010. He's the recipient of the prestigious NSF Graduate Fellowship. And he finishes his PhD in 2015 and is now an assistant professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Brad Greening, 
finished his PhD in 2014 and is now a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta. And Robert McDavid is the student whose personal statement you saw at the beginning of the talk is now a graduate student at Princeton University. So in the last six to seven years, we have had 13 students go on to some of the top programs in the country. We have two students who have won NSF graduate research fellowships, and we have a couple of students who have won uh, uh, awards at the CRA undergraduate research competition. And this is from a department which graduates no more than 20 students per year on average, right? So what are some of the takeaways? First is resource augmentation. The students at Camden had two key resources. First of all, they had intense mentoring from me. They had, they had somebody who, so I had, a, they, they had an unwavering support from me. It was two people working towards one person's goal, one person's success. So clearly the chances of that person succeeding is going to be high. Right? Second, funding from the National Science Foundation. This was instrumental in Tom getting a position at Virginia Tech. This was key in our students being able to quit their jobs and focus on education. Right? Without that, I don't know if these things would have been possible. Role models. The success of Brad and other students have been an inspiration to others. It took me a lot of effort to convince the first couple of people to focus on academics, but after that, these students have been the role models. Other students, future students, want to, want, want to follow their footsteps. Strong work ethic. While our students have done a lot of physical hard work to support themselves, they were not used to working hard academically. This, the Math Foundation's course instilled in them the work ethic that was needed to success academically, to, to, to succeed ac academically. And early exposure to research helped them stand out and, and, and become competitive. And finally, the following quote by Julian Sid, who was a high school junior with whom I worked, uh, basically summarizes my talk nicely. Ordinary people, when given a chance, can perform extraordinary tasks. Thank you very much. <laughs>